<laughs> Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face behind my back and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. <laughs> Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelche. Yo, and welcome to the latest edition of the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and once again, I am joined by my special guest, Tiger Muay Thai fitness trainer and pro MMA fighter, Sam Bastin. Sam, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, good. It's good to be back here again, Antoine. Uh, thanks for... Uh, Thanks for having me back. So on that note, we have a lot to talk about today because we have a big fight weekend. Uh, tonight, uh, it's Friday, there's Invicta FC 11 and Bellator 134. I already did uh, a preview podcast about those things, so we're going to skip to the big guns and jump all over UFC 184. So as we all know, uh, UFC 184, there's a big title fight, women's bantamweight, Ronda Rousey against Kat Zingano, but uh, amidst all the hype... It might have been lost in the mix that this fight was supposed to be a totally different card and there were some incredible matchups that were announced that fell apart. So I'd like to, uh, just before going into the actual card that's going to go down, I thought yeah. we could discuss what this card was actually planned to be and some of the unfortunate incidents that uh, that occurred that, that altered this card quite radically. So, uh, of course, the, the big fight that was supposed to occur here was a, a UFC middleweight championship bout between Chris Weidman and Vitor Belfort. Um, that, that much delayed pairing was previously scheduled to take place also at UFC 173 and also at UFC 181. Uh, on January 30th, the UFC announced that Weidman had pulled out of the bout, citing an injury sustained in training. <laughs> I mean, what a loss to this card. I know, yeah, this this is a, a great fight, uh, potentially a great fight. Um, and with having to reschedule this fight three to four times now, yep. and maybe even another time again. It still hasn't happened, but I'm really looking forward to that fight because I think Vitor can uh, definitely pull an upset towards... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just a, it's just an absolute slobber knocker in the making. Uh, to see that uh, you know it was supposed to happen at UFC 173, 181, and then today or tomorrow on 184 and is now officially scheduled at UFC 187, this fight just has to happen, man. It, it does, just cursed. It does. <laughs> and uh, like you said, with this card, and um, this this has been rescheduled three times now, plus the amount of other rescheduling fights that have had to occur on this on this show as well. So, what do you think about the uh, the, the rise of Chris Weidman? I mean, I think that uh, it's it's an incredible story. I mean, this guy seemingly came out of nowhere. I remember seeing him fight his first few fights in the UFC, and he was really, really taking it to guys. And then I remember he went into a decision. Uh, against Damian Maya, hmm. but really where where Weidman uh, put the fear of God in, in me and a few other viewers was when he beat up Mark Munoz. I don't know if you remember that fight. That was a good fight, and the, the finisher with the elbow, that was nasty. Hellacious. I mean, the elbow that he hit him with on the feet, but especially the elbows that he kept hitting him with on the ground. Definitely. I think that, uh, that that altered Mark Munoz's career. I've met Mark Munoz, actually, working on UFC Undisputed 3. Really, really nice guy. Uh, this was before um, this happened, and uh, you know he was he was on a he had a really really good mojo going on. He, he had a, and, and it seems like since since the Weidman loss that uh, Munoz hasn't down. quite been. I mean that was yeah that that, yeah. that really set back Munoz's career. Yeah, he has uh, Munoz has been struggling a little bit since that fight there. I think he was on at one stage about a four or five win streak uh, before he came up against. Yeah, he was Weidman. being talked about as a title contender for sure. And uh, then ran into the freight train that is Chris Weidman. Uh, and then, then let's go to Vitor. I mean, Vitor has just been a wrecking machine. Three three head kick knockouts over yeah. Luke Rockhold, yeah. Michael Bisping, and uh, the indestructible Dan Anderson. Yeah, in uh, all in devastating fashion as well. Those yeah. head kicks have all been pretty brutal. So. Yeah, when I was just building my website, um, TrashTalkMMA.com, I, uh, I, uh, I have a podcast section and a news and, and blog section, and then a video section, and uh, I, didn't really have, I didn't have anything to put in the video section yet, but uh, the UFC had given away uh, a free fight, and it was Vitor Belfort against uh, Dan Henderson, and so I decided to, to revisit that fight, and oh my god, it was just brutal. And I mean, he clobbered him on the feet with punches, and then as soon as he stood up, he literally kicked him shin to mouth. And I don't, I don't think anyone actually seen Dan Henderson go out out like that as well. That's the Never. first time he's ever ever yep. been stopped uh, like via strikes. So yeah, KTFO'd. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Mental. <laughs> Mental. All right. Let's keep working our way down the card. So subsequently, uh, with the loss of that main event, a UFC Women's Bantamweight Championship bout between current champion Ronda Rousey and top contender Kat Zingano was promoted to the main event. Uh, Belfort was offered an interim title fight against Lyoto Machido and then Gegard Mousasi as a replacement for Weidman, but he declined and stated that he would only fight for the full title. I, I think Vitor did the right thing. I don't want to see Vitor Machida. I certainly don't want to see Vitor Mousasi. Those guys, yeah. you know, they're, they're just not in the position that he's in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's also Vitor has that position to say that that as well. I mean, with all the the drug scandals and things going on lately, wasn't he accused of doing some sort of well, he was drugs he was or... uh, he was one of the elite fighters on testosterone replacement therapy on TRT. Yeah. yeah. So he's I, I agree he's had to get off of that and um, adapt his body to not having that uh, that substance in it in order for him to be licensed to compete. Yeah. He's actually uh, undergone a, an extensive series of out of competition testing that so far he's passed with flying colors. That's good. I mean, if I, I think he I think he's in the clear on that level. It's just going to be interesting to see if his performance is, uh, is altered uh, because of not having TRT in his system. I mean, I think he should be fine. So hopefully we can see him back in there soon. Um, I was hoping that he would have taken either one of those fights against uh, Machida. He, he should have taken that fight, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's another fight. Everyone, everyone's here yeah. for the same reason. Uh, interim title as well. That would have potentially set him up straight away for a, as, as soon as... Um, He's ready for for Weidman straight away for the for that match. Because did 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 Machida have a fight since losing to Weidman? I don't think so. I don't think he has. No. So I'm like, okay, I don't know. To me, the way I the way I perceive that is that Machida, you know, Machida lost to Weidman. He hasn't had a fight since. Uh, to immediately get another title fight off of a loss against Vitor, I don't think that Machida had earned it. And certainly, Gegard Mousasi has been really up and down. He looked great against Dan Henderson. But even that stoppage was somewhat controversial with the eye cut, and you know, the, the, you know, people thought the fight was stopped a little too soon. So I don't think either of those. I, I think they could have put up a fight against yes. those guys, yeah, but to make it an interim title fight, Machida, there might be some justification for it, but I wouldn't be able to give that to Masasi yet. Yeah, okay, no. yeah. Uh, so then another fight, um, Neil Magny, who's on a six-fight winning streak at welterweight, was briefly linked to a bout with Josh Koscheck at the event. However, Magny was pulled from the fight in favor of a bout with Kiichi Kunimoto at UFC Fight Night 60. I think that happened three, four weeks ago. Um, and Koscheck is now facing Jake Ellenberger on this card. This is an interesting fight due to the fact that both of these guys are coming into this fight with three losses apiece. Um, obviously, they're uh, both coming off, I think it's TKO losses in their last fights. Well, I remember Possibly. Koscheck got absolutely smashed by Lawler. Um, yeah. Ellenberger got uh, smashed by... Um, Kelvin Gass- Gasolin. Gasolin, yeah. yes. Yeah. Kelvin Gasolin. He didn't TKO him. He smashed him on the feet and, and then submitted him on yes, the ground. Yes, on the ground, yeah. Um, what, did, what else happened to Koscheck? Koscheck got... Oh, dude, Koscheck got his face punched off by Tyrone Woodley. Remember that? Yeah, that was... That was gnarly. That was a nasty knockout. That was that a one. nasty knockout. That was one of the best highlight reels of last year. It was uh, That was an incredible um, incredible stoppage by um, by Tyrone. My opinion on both fighters right now is at least Josh Koscheck has been coming out and fighting like Josh Koscheck. Where I'm upset with Jake Ellenberger is that he's changed his style. Mm. He's put out some interviews this week saying that there's no room for Jake Ellenberger in the octagon. Nobody wants to see Jake Ellenberger in the, oct- Jake Ellenberger in the octagon. People want to see the juggernaut. And I think that's right. You know, he, he switched up his style, and I hate when guys do that. You know, to a certain extent, I feel like Rory McDonald's done the same thing. You know, he came out, that fight where he was... Uh, he was fucking around with Nate Diaz, just throwing him all, all, all across the octagon, suplexes. And it almost looked like a pro wrestling fight the way he was ragdolling him. You know, so he was beating the earth, wind, and fire out of dudes, right? And then, and then that just stopped and it turned into this kind of this, this pity patty point fighting shit that, you know, he did it against BJ Penn. And yeah. I friggin' hate when guys come out with that, with that, that that's a aptly named style, a, a juggernaut style of guys that come out and bulldoze and steamroll dudes. And Jake Ellenberg was awesome for that. I loved how he plowed through Jake Shields. Uh, I'm definitely not a Jake Shields fan. I mean, I don't know the guy personally, but I don't like his fighting style. Um, you know, J- Ellenberger for me was one of the, the, the style of fighter that I liked to see. And I haven't seen him bring that in four or five fights. It's interesting that we're talking about fighting styles because this day and age with the, the uprise in all these new athletes that are coming through the MMA, 
that's the problem. They're athletes. There's not as many fighters around these days. These guys aren't going in there to yep. knock someone out. They're going in there to just grind out a decision. And I think yep. that's a big problem with the, with the MMA scene in the UFC at this stage. I think there needs to be some more aspects to where these guys are actually trying to finish fights. Yeah, I mean, I think in Ellenberger's case, I mean, he's certainly proven that he's a tremendous fighter and that he's a tremendous athlete. What's interesting in his case is to see the sort of mental deterioration. And look, I hope he brings it. I hope he brings it tomorrow night. But as of right now, until I see Jake Ellenberger bring the fight and push the pace, I'll be rooting for Koscheck because Koscheck has, has been... He's been a UFC staple. I think it's his 18th or 19th fight. I mean, the guy has been there, He's done been that, yeah. and he always, always, always brings it. And I love how he modified his style, coming out being a bit of a, you know, a bit of a boring lay and pray type wrestler style, and then he developed into a tremendous power puncher, very exciting fighter, a real company man. I'll be rooting for uh, Josh Koscheck tomorrow night. I'm with you on that. I'm going through Koscheck for a decision. A decision. A decision. Well, I hope Koscheck gets a knockout. Or listen, I hope Jake Ellenberger does too. You know, wh- whatever it does. I mean, if, if Jake Ellenberger comes back and puts on the juggernaut style, I'll be the first one rooting. But in the meantime, he's had the opportunity to do that against top flight competition. He also lost to uh, Robbie Lawler. Yes. That's uh, that's the other loss. Lawler, man. Okay, we'll get to him. <laughs> Jesus, that guy's crazy. Moving on down. About between uh, touted newcomer Holly Holm and Raquel Pennington, originally booked for UFC 181 and ultimately scrapped due to Holm being injured, will now serve as the co-headliner. You excited to see Holm in the UFC? Excited to see uh, female fights in general. I'm a big fan of the female fights due to the fact that these girls bring it to the table every time. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I have. Uh, are you subscribed to UFC Fight Pass? Uh, no, I'm not actually. They, they've actually, um, maybe we can do this after we watch this. Uh, they've posted uh, basically, I think, all of Holly Holmes' uh, fights yeah. they, in other promotions. So we can uh, we can watch them because they've all been very quick and devastating. And I wouldn't mind uh, just doing a little research on all, all of her scraps before we uh, tune into that fight tomorrow night. Uh, Mark Munoz was briefly scheduled to for a bout with Caio Malgalas at the event. However, shortly after the bout was announced by the UFC, Malgalas indicated that he would not be able to compete at the event due to a lingering infection after recent dental surgery, which would require additional surgery. Munoz is expected to stay on the card, and he is against a UFC veteran, a returning UFC veteran, Juan Carnero. Yeah, so Juan Carnero, he's been with American Top Team since uh, 2008. He did a stint in the UFC where he was kind of off and on, uh, no, not too many notable wins. And since leaving the UFC on a loss to Rio Chonin, he's been he's gone seven and one uh, with one submission loss. No real uh, notable names with his victories, except for his last one that was over a uh, veteran Brock Larson. Mark Munoz on his end is uh, he's in a slump for sure. You know we touched on it at the start of the show. He's one and three. He got submitted by Gegar Mousasi, head kick knocked out by Leo Machida. Won a decision over uh, Tim Boach before that. And he, he actually looked good in that in his return after that vicious loss to uh, Chris Weidman. The difference between these two guys, I think uh, Munoz has still been fighting some top caliber fighters. These guys are still in the top 10. Yeah, that's a good and point. And with this other guy coming back to the UFC, I think that's a, uh, a different caliber of fighter in general. That's a very, very good point. Uh, you know, we're quick to write Munoz off here as being on a, you know, on a, on a bit of a, uh, and it's a bit of a funk, but, uh, you know, Gegard Mousasi. Dude, do you remember when Gegard Mousasi was fighting in Dream? Like, he was running through, dude. He was running through Dennis Kang. He was ru- he, he, uh, he knocked out Jacare from his back with a fucking, uh, you know, an upkick. Upkick, Upkick yeah, yeah. to the jaw. Brutal. Made short work out of, uh, of Ma- uh, Melvin Manhoff. At that time, I was actually hoping to be like, yo, get this guy in the UFC. He's on fire. I could actually see him putting up a competitive fight against Anderson Silva, who was on a, you know, on the Anderson Silva tear at the time. Yeah, I think like it really depends who who comes with, with the better game plan for the fight. Uh, obviously, not sticking to just one game plan, but who who can come and bring the best of their ability to the board for this fight? Yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, Munoz has just been facing elite competition all this time, whereas uh, Juan Carnero has been out of the UFC facing, you know, not easy competition, but certainly not elite level competition. And uh, we might see uh, Munoz come through with a with a pretty brutal victory based on that alone. I think Munoz. Well, I've I've definitely got his back on this one with a uh, a stoppage. Stoppage win for this. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that. So continuing on with the changes that have occurred on this card, a heavyweight bout between Frank Mir and Antonio Silva 
Originally scheduled for the main card, was moved up a week and served as the event headliner for UFC Fight Night 61 that just occurred this past Saturday. So, of course, we know what happened there. Uh, a slick jab followed by a short little, what looked like a relatively harmless left hook um, by by Frank Mir. Uh, put the lights out on Antonio Silva, followed up by a v- horrifying ground and pound. Uh, and that, that goes to show with uh, Bigfoot's chin, it has been quite suspect in his last couple of fights as well. Yep. Um, he did have that big slug with Mark Hunt. Yep. That was a, a very, very tough fight for both of those guys as well. But coming to uh, coming to this fight with Mir, uh, Mir looked very, very sharp on his feet. I think that's the best he's looked in a very long time. Good slick boxing, nice and quick, moving well, setting things up really good. Yeah, I think if we look back at uh, you know at Bigfoot's recent fights, um, getting knocked out cold by uh, Daniel Cormier in Strike Force, uh, putting on that that war with. Um, with Hunt, even though, I mean, if he didn't get knocked out, I mean, he still took just an unfathomable amount of power shots by Mark Hunt. Uh, you know, and, and doctors will tell you that's not because you don't get knocked out that you're not getting concussed. Um, he also, uh, I mean, he had that, that crushing victory over, uh, over, over him, but, uh, then he also got, you know, punched out very quickly by Andre Arlovsky in his previous fight. And now this, this, uh, this fight by Frank Mir. What did you think of the quality of that hook? Um, you know, you're a pro fighter, you know better than me. I thought I thought Mir barely put his hips into it. It didn't look like a knockout punch. It just looked like it honestly touched him. But at the end of the day, accuracy, heavyweights. Accuracy, yeah, they're, they're big. They're big guys. These guys. And exactly. You clip someone on the chin. That that jaw slides across. Probably could put anyone out. Yep. You know, it just depends on where you get hit, how you get hit. Yeah, working on the UFC video games, we'd often uh, you know launch the games in Vegas, and at those times we'd have the opportunity to you know we'd do these launch parties where the UFC would bring in a good 50, 60 UFC fighters, and uh, so it was a great opportunity to meet some of these guys. And it's funny when you'd stand next to some of them, you know, I don't know guys like Dan Hardy and stuff, and they didn't really feel that intimidatingly big. Even you know, I remember. Uh, Standing and talking with Rich Franklin, and you know he's he's a 185, and people consider him a big one. But I still didn't feel, you know, like this guy. Okay, this guy's you know scary, but you stand next to Frank Muir, dude. He's a big, thick, fucking scary dude. He's and like you dude. said, he's a heavy. We're talking heavyweights here, yeah. even though they're not putting maybe everything into it. What they're putting there is going to put you down. Yeah, I mean these guys. What are they? What are they walk around in pounds? I'm not sure, too sure. <laughs> it's. I mean they walk yeah. around right. Weight is is, yeah. is insane, you know. Um, yeah. So once they're dropping down and cutting to, cutting to the weight, and then putting all this weight back on, these dudes are walking in pretty heavy in a, into that cage. Yeah. All right. Next up, there was a, a middleweight bout scheduled between Ronaldo Souza Jacare. He was expected to face Yoel Romero at this event. However, on January fifteenth, Souza was forced to withdraw from this bout with pneumonia. The pairing was left intact, and the fight has now been rescheduled for UFC on Fox fifteen. I'm pissed this fight ain't happening now. I'm a huge fan of both of these fighters. And Yoel Romero, to me, has been the most refreshing addition to the middleweight division. I'm honestly not too familiar with either fighter. Um, I don't know why. I just obviously missed out on on their careers slightly. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I'm not too familiar with their backgrounds and things like that. Okay, all I can say is go check out both guys. Uh, That's another thing. We can fire up Fight Pass and uh, find some Ronaldo, some Jacare fights. He's... uh, an incredible grappler, an incredible um, submission artist, and he's added a level of athleticism and strike into his game that's just frightening. A very, very all-around complete fighter. He decimated Gegard Mousasi in a rematch of the fight that I was talking I about before one, yeah. of when he got yeah. up, kicked, knocked out in Dream. Uh, Yoel Romero, you you didn't see that fight against Tim Kennedy? You know where he stayed too long on the stool? It happened a couple, yeah, couple months ago. Yep, so yep. That, that's Yoel Romero. Okay, you know, he's okay. this big, thick black dude, and he comes out, and he eats a lot of shots, and he just has this capacity to come back from the brink of defeat and obliterate guys on the way out. So, I mean, I just like those dudes. He, they, they make for interesting fights. I mean, obviously, that fight was uh, was controversial. Um, if you didn't see it, Tim Kennedy versus Yoel Romero. Um Kennedy had Romero really, really on the rocks at the end of, I believe, the round, second round two. Yeah, and then that's where he stayed on the stool. He stayed on the stool. Big John McCarthy uh, approached him and told him he had to get up and join the fight. And then he noticed there was a big glob of Vaseline on his eye still. So then he brought in the the corner guys to remove the glob of Vaseline. It basically gave Romero another an another minute. 30 seconds to a minute to to get his uh, his wits back to him. And then he came out like a, like a bat out of hell. And... Um, and, and, and just tore, uh, tore Kennedy up, man, in what was one of the, the most vicious displays of striking uh, of late last year. 
Anyway, thank God the fight's rescheduled for UFC on Fox 15. It's going to be huge. Um, we'll deal with that when that date comes around. Last but not least, uh, Yancey Medeiros was slated to face Tony Ferguson at this event, but an injured foot forced him out of the bout on the same day. Gleason Tebow was announced as his replacement. Is it just me or is Tebow fighting like uh, every every month or something these days? He has been uh, very, very active lately. Um, he, it's good that he's coming off three wins. Both of the, these guys are actually coming off three wins. Um, Tony Ferguson, 17-3. and three. Gleason Tebow, 33-10. This is a very, uh, very highly educated fight because these guys have both have a lot of experience up their sleeves. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, doesn't Gleason Tebow hold the record for the, I think he's the UFC fighter who's had the most UFC fights. He's got a weird career though. Like, it's like he's kind of always there. He's like outside of the top 10. He's, he's been there for like five years or something. Like, What's stopping Gleason Tebow from getting into the top 10 and actually making a run at the title? I think he gets, uh, with his career, if you actually look at his career, I think he has like a couple of good wins and then he'll get that, that loss that just sets him back a, a, a step or two every time. And then again, like his, la- his last three wins have all been by decision. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the problem as well. We're not seeing a- amazing efforts from him. We're still seeing just a, a grind out sort of, um, obviously going to decision every time. Yeah, because, I mean, if you look at his last three wins, they're against uh, Norman Park, Piotr Hallman, Pat Healy. Okay, nobody, you know, the only guy in there that's worth mentioning is Pat Healy. Pre- before that, he got knocked out by Michael Johnson. That was vicious. Before that, he won a split decision over uh, one of my favorite farters. Uh, farters. Fighters. <laughs> one of my favorite farters. One of my favorite fighters, Jamie Varner. Okay, yeah, when, uh, you know, Jamie Varner's awesome. Now retired. Um, and then before that, he had a submission over Josh, John Cholish. Again, not an elite fighter. Previously to that, lost a decision, a split decision to Evan Dunham. Won a decision over Francisco Trinaldo. Lost a decision to... Uh, the number two contender right now could be the Nurmagomedov. So yeah, I mean, he just can't get on that that run of wins and get stoppage wins. Yeah, that's it. It's just up, down, up, down. He's never putting together that that consecutive amount of fights where I think he can break through that uh, yeah. t- that top ten scene. Tony Ferguson on the other end, uh, I'm a big fan. I think uh, since emerging fr- as the winner of the Ultimate Fighter, uh, Team Lesnar versus Team Dos Santos, Tony Ferguson has looked fantastic. Yeah, again, like I said earlier, seventeen three record. He's had some tough fights. Um, I'm I'm very interested in this fight because I'm a big fan of Gleison Tebow. So I I think he's going to win this fight, and I think he'll win it by decision again. Uh, but I would like to see more from Tebow in this fight. So what makes you a big fan of Gleison Tebow? I've never met somebody actually say that. Like- I've, I, I've I just in, I enjoy his fights. I do. I, I like watching him fight and. I see him gas every every time he gasses in that second round, but he still pulls through. Somehow he just yeah, he's durable. Yeah, he's very, he's, he's a very durable fighter, and that's why it's always impressive when somebody stops him because you're just used to him always going the 15 minutes. Yeah. So Ferguson is coming off a win over uh, a submission win over uh, another one of my current favorite fighters, Abel Trujillo. He's really good. Uh, did a split decision win over Danny Castillo. That's nothing to to scoff at either. A KO over uh, Katsunori Kikuno. And uh, a submission win over Mike Rio. And previously before that, he also has a loss to uh, to Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson, who just beat um, Edson Barbosa on Saturday night before Frank Mir and Antonio Silva. So Michael Johnson is a, kind of the, the common thread between those two fighters. And uh, contrary to uh, Gleason Tebow, Michael Johnson's certainly been able to put together an incredible streak of wins right now. He's 4-0. So we've looked at uh, quite a few of the of the, of the big fights. Uh, we're going to be getting to the main event soon. Uh, I just want to roll back to um, the prelims where there's a, going to be a bantamweight fight against uh, Roman Salazar and uh, Norifumi, a.k.a. Kid Yamamoto. Um, Kid Yamamoto, what a, what, a, what a bust in the UFC. And uh, what's happened to this guy's career? He was on, he was on fire in Japan. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of anticipation for him coming into the UFC. And when he did, uh, he made his debut in February 2011 at UFC 126, and he got soundly defeated by uh, current uh, champion Demetrius Johnson of the UFC flyweight division. After that, he lost a decision to Darren Uyanoyama, and I also got submitted by by Voan Lee. So, I mean, things are not looking good for Kid Yamamoto. He's, uh, I mean, he's basically one in five in his last six. Well, he, uh, yeah, he better probably win this this matchup he's got coming up because I think the UFC will probably knock him knock him back. 
It's interesting that they chose to bring him back on on this card. You'd think that with him being one in five, that uh, you know that they would have maybe put him on this Philippines card, or at least put you know a popular Asian fighter on a fight taking place in Asia, where they're a lot more forgiving for you know extensive loss records. You know, back in Pride, people could you know if you were an, if you were an exciting fighter, you could go lose six, seven, eight fights. No one cared. You know, as long as you brought the fighting spirit. Uh, you know, a Western crowd and in particular an American and Canadian crowd are yeah. a lot less forgiving for people with, uh, you know, one in five records fighting in the UFC. Moving back up to the main card, um, let's talk about Alan Juban versus Richard Walsh at uh, Welterweight. Alan Juban had an interesting UFC debut where he knocked out the always durable Seth Basinski. That was the biggest win and the biggest name on Juban's record. And from there, he went on to lose a decision at UFC Fight Night Shogun versus St. Pru in November of 2014 versus Warley Alves. He'll be fighting Richard Walsh, who is um, an Australian mixed martial artist. That's where you're from. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually went to the to the tryouts with Richie Walsh. Uh, I think he's got a, a good chance of winning this fight. Both fighters are very, very durable fighters. Uh, Richard Walsh with his, with his fighting. Uh, he's only had two fights in the UFC now. His win against, uh, Chris Indich, also from Australia. And, uh, I'm not too sure who he's, uh, yeah, he, he had has, a controversial, yeah, yeah, yeah. controversial he has a decision to split loss to Kichi Kunimoto. Yeah. That's the guy that, uh, that Neil Magny beat a couple weekends ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Richie Walsh coming to the, to the fight with an eight and two record. I see a very even matchup, uh, with Alan Juban being a 10 and three record. A really good, uh, good potential matchup, but I see Richie Walsh winning a decision. Okay, now when you said you came to the tryouts with him, what do you mean the tryouts? Yeah, sorry, uh, back to that, the tryouts with uh, Richie Walsh. I was actually at the tryouts in Sydney uh, for Australia versus Canada. Oh, so, so you mean the tryouts, tryouts for the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, for the okay. Ultimate Fighter. Yep. Oh, nice. So you actually attended those? Yeah, I did. Yeah. How, how, what was that experience like? Yeah, different different uh, experience. Um, hopefully next time, if I ever go back to maybe another tryouts in the future, okay. I get a bit, uh, a bit more of an actual tryout. Half the guys there, and you only get like two minutes of, of wrestling, two minutes of sort of jujitsu, and then if if they're not uh, very interested with you, they send half the guys home like instantly. Okay, maybe that's something that uh, you know when, when we do another uh, you know when we do another uh, one on one podcast, we could we could cover that. I've yeah. actually never spoken with somebody who's attended one of these Ultimate Fighter tryouts, and I think that'd be a, an interesting thing that my listeners would like to hear about. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so then moving on, let's talk about the main event. We got Ronda Rousey, women's bantamweight champion, undefeated versus Katzingano. I find this fight uh, the most interesting female fight in the UFC uh, since the obviously since the females have been around. Uh, both fighters are undefeated: Rousey ten and zero, Zingano nine and nine and zero. Uh, I think depends on who shows up better on the night because Zingano has had a lot of time off. Rousey has been quite uh, quite, quite regular, active. active with the fights. Yeah, yeah I mean, like Rousey's last fight was, uh, you know, July 5th of last year. Um, whereas Kat Zingano, when did she last compete? She last competed against Amanda Nunes in September of last year. And I think so, that's the only fight she's had. In yeah. Yeah, well, she was injured. Well. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, for sure, uh, within a comparable period of time, Ronda Rousey's been the more active fighter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who are you rooting for? What, what what would you like to see happen? You know, we're in a situation here, almost like a John Jones's type situation. I would like to see Kat Zingano bring a fight to uh, Ronda Rousey the way that Alexander Gustafson brought a fight to John Jones. We, I, we need to start seeing some chinks in the Ronda Rousey armor or things are just not going to be interesting anymore in this division. I think where Zingano can win this is on the feet, if she can keep it up. Um, obviously, Rousey's striking has developed a lot as well. Um and also, obviously, her whole fighting style has developed. Her last two fights have both been by TKO stoppages, if, yep. if, if that's correct. Yep, both by TKO stoppages. Um, and again, yeah, Zingano, she's been out for a little while. But again, it's a, it's a very, very hard fight to pick from. I'm leading towards Rousey winning the fight, but I would like to see Zingano win the fight. Yeah. If that complicates things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does and it, it does and it doesn't. Um, Kat Zingano's faced tremendous adversity. Uh, if you look at uh, the, some of the personal, uh, some of the tragedies that she's experienced in her life of late, uh, you know, she, 
she lost her husband, I believe, to suicide. Yes. About a year ago, um, she she had an incredible fight where she demolished uh, the the incredible Misha Tate, who looked just spectacular in her last fight. What what a what a durable woman, you know. So she 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 won that fight. It made her the number one contender. She was supposed to be on the Ultimate Fighter against Ronda Rousey and get a title shot. She lost that opportunity. She lost the title shot, and she lost her husband. Uh, I mean, even even she's saying that she has a lot of similar traits in her life that correspond with similar uh, traits in Ronda Rousey's life. And I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of respect between these two fighters, unlike, for example, the Ronda Rousey-Misha Tate rivalry. I think that's a funny, interesting fact as well, with Rousey actually not showing much respect for a lot of the previous female fighters. Yep. With Singano, I think she's going to definitely... Uh, Show you some respect. Yeah, I think she's probably saying to herself, this is this is going to be a good test. Yeah, definitely. You know? But um, I think Ronda Rousey has been a tremendous addition to the UFC. You know, only a few short years ago, uh, Dana White was saying you'd never see women in the in the octagon. Uh, they are now in the octagon and they're for the very first time tonight or tomorrow night. They'll be uh, headlining and co-headlining a UFC pay-per-view. I mean, and that's also uh, UFC history too with a with a headline and a co-headline as well. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a legit numbered UFC pay-per-view. Of course, this event was supposed to have Chris Weidman versus Vitor, you know, which was the real seller here. But um, you know, Ronda Rousey's a bona fide superstar. She's in the swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated. She's all over the place. And I love her cuz she knows how to talk a ton of shit. She's talking a ton of shit about Ariani right now. Did you have you been following that? A little bit of it. Oh, I haven't dude. seen too much of it. You know, she said something like, you know, to Ariani, like, yo, it's like your job is to show your tits, and I'm even doing that better than you. It's like some funny, funny stuff. So I'm always a fan of uh, the people that walk, that talk the talk, and also walk the walk. And Ronda Rousey certainly, certainly fits that category, undeniably. What's your, what's your opinion on the fight? Who would you like to see uh, pull the victory? Okay, tonight. You have uh, a featherweight title fight in Invicta uh, involving uh, Cyborg Santos. So if she can win, uh, she's fighting, uh, I believe, Charmaine Tweet. Tweet's being set up here to get steamrolled. Uh, she doesn't at all have the credentials to, to fight to, to fight Cyborg. So, you know, Cyborg's going to come out of this thing victorious. Uh, the Invicta champ at 45. We, we all know about the beef between her and Ronda. I'd like to see Cyborg win tonight. Drop down to 135, make it successfully, have a fight in Invicta at that weight class, or even a debut fight in the UFC at that weight class. Class, prove that she can fight at that weight, and then let's let's get that fight because that is the super fight. The fight with Kat Zingano here is probably the most truly legit women's bantamweight fight that could be made in the world right now, and it's I expect it to be excellent. But the fight that everybody wants to see and that has. Really, all the trash talk, all the bad blood is the fight between uh, Ronda and Cyborg. Definitely, definitely. It's a very interesting fight if that can ever happen. Yeah. So for for Ronda to lose this fight, it would still always make for an interesting fight. But for her being the champ and if the Invicta 145 champ is coming in, there's all this bad blood. I mean, it could potentially be one of the biggest fights in UFC history. And it would be between two women, which would be just an incredible turn of events uh, just over the course of a very few short years. I think it's, it's only been almost two years now since the female divisions have been in the UFC yep. and definitely making a, a big impact um, as a lot of these females, again, are bringing the fight to the table, bringing their, bringing their skills to the table every 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 show. You training at Tiger Muay Thai, uh, every time I go into that place, I feel like I'm seeing more and more chicks. I walk in there someday and I see like almost, <laughs> I'm like, where are the dudes training? It's like there's tons and tons of, of women training. You're, you're training there, you're there every day. What are your thoughts? Are you seeing? Are you really seeing women getting interested in competing in martial arts? Yeah, martial arts in general. I think it's we see a lot of females crossing towards doing Muay Thai here first. Yep. Uh, I think that is a, a big aspect of MMA in itself. Um, starting learning Muay Thai. So for a lot of females, that's where they generally begin. Not so much towards the MMA side, but seeing them get involved with the Muay Thai is definitely yep. interesting. Okay, well, Sam, it looks like we've pretty much covered the entire card. Uh, I'm stoked. I think UFC 184 was supposed to be something bigger, but you know, sitting down with he- you here and actually going through this, there's a lot of interesting fighters on this card. There's still some star power on it. There's some interesting matchups, and above all, there's really some notable matchups. So, you know, let's just tune in. Uh, let's tune in. I guess for us, it'll be Sunday morning here in Thailand, 
and uh, see what goes down and see if Ronda Rousey can successfully defend her belt against uh, her most dangerous threat. Definitely an interesting card. Can't wait to catch all these fights Sunday morning here in Thailand. It's going to be good. All right, man. I'm going to hold you to it. We're going to watch those Sunday, and we'll be doing the recap together. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Uh, TrashTalkMMA.com. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, with my guest, pro fighter Sam Bastin from Australia, signing off from Phuket, Thailand. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA. I think that... Uh, it's it's an incredible story. I mean, this guy seemingly came out of nowhere. I remember seeing him fight his first few fights in the UFC, and he was really, really taking it to guys. And then I remember he went into a decision uh, against Damian Maya, hmm. but really where where Weidman uh, put the fear of God in in me and a few other viewers was when he beat up Mark Munoz. I don't know if you remember that fight. That was a good fight, and the the finisher with the elbow that was nasty, hellacious. I mean, the elbow that he hit him with on the feet, but especially the elbows that he kept hitting him with on the ground. Definitely. I think that uh, that that altered Mark Munoz's career. I've met Mark Munoz actually working on UFC Undisputed Three. Really, really nice guy. Uh, this was before um, this happened, and uh, you know he was he was on a. He had a really, really good mojo going on. He, he had, a, and, and it seems like since since the Weidman loss that uh, Munoz hasn't down. quite been. I mean, that was yeah, that that, yeah. that really set back Munoz's career. Yeah, he has. Uh, Munoz has been struggling a little bit since that fight there. I think he was on at one stage about a four or five win streak uh, before he came up against. Yeah, he was Weidman. being talked about as a title contender for sure. And uh, then ran into the freight train that is Chris Weidman. Uh, and then, then let's go to Vitor. I mean, Vitor has just been a wrecking machine. Three three head kick knockouts over yeah. Luke Rockhold, yeah. Michael Bisping, and uh, the indestructible Dan Anderson. Yeah, in, uh, all in devastating fashion as well. Those yep. head kicks have all been pretty brutal. So. Yeah, when I was just... Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face behind my back, it's all trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. I don't want to hear it! Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the latest edition of the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and once again, I am joined by my special guest, Tiger Muay Thai, fitness trainer and pro MMA fighter, Sam Bastin. Sam, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, good. It's good to be back here again, Antoine. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me back. So on that note, we have a lot to talk about today because we have a big fight weekend. Uh, tonight, uh, it's Friday, there's Invicta FC 11 and Bellator 134. I already did uh, a preview podcast about those things, so we're going to skip to the big guns and jump all over UFC 184. So as we all know, uh, UFC 184, there's a big title fight, women's bantamweight, Ronda Rousey against Kat Zingano, but uh, amidst all the hype, it might have been lost in the mix that this fight was supposed to be a totally different card, and there were some incredible matchups that were announced that fell apart. So I'd like to... Uh, just before going into the actual card that's going to go down, I thought yeah. we could discuss what this card was actually planned to be and some of the unfortunate incidents that uh, that occurred that, that altered this card quite radically. So, uh, of course, the, the big fight that was supposed to occur here was a, a UFC middleweight championship bout between Chris Weidman and Vitor Belfort. Um, that, that much delayed pairing was previously scheduled to take place also at UFC 173 and also at UFC 181. Uh, on January 30th, the UFC announced that Weidman had pulled out of the bout citing an injury sustained in training. <laughs> I mean, what a loss to this card. I know, yeah, this this is a, a great fight, uh, potentially a great fight. Um, and with having to reschedule this fight three to four times now, yep. and maybe even another time again, it still hasn't happened. But I'm really looking forward to that fight because I think Vitor can uh, definitely pull an upset towards... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just a, it's just an absolute slobber knocker in the making. Uh, to see that, uh, you know, it was supposed to happen at UFC 173, 181, and then today or tomorrow on 184 and is now officially scheduled at UFC 187 
this fight just has to happen, man. It, it it's does, just cursed. It does. <laughs> and uh, like you said, that with this card, and um, this this has been rescheduled three times now, plus the amount of other rescheduling fights that have had to occur on this on this show as well. So, what do you think about the uh, the, the rise of Chris Weidman? I mean, building my website um, trashtalkmma.com, <laughs> I, uh, I was uh, I have a podcast section and a news and, and blog section, and then a video section, and uh, I didn't really have I didn't have anything to put in the video section yet. But uh, the UFC had given away uh, a free fight, and it was Vitor Belfort against uh, Dan Henderson. And so I decided to, to revisit that fight, and oh my god, it was just brutal. And I mean, he clobbered him on the feet with punches, and then as soon as he stood up, he literally kicked him shin to mouth. And I don't, I don't think anyone actually seen Dan Henderson go out, out like that as well. That's the Never. first time he's ever, ever been yep. stopped uh, like via strikes. So Yeah, KTFO'd. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mental. <laughs> Mental. <laughs> All right. Let's keep working our way down the card. So, subsequently, uh, with the loss of that main event, a UFC Women's Bantamweight Championship bout between current champion Ronda Rousey and top contender Kat Zingano was promoted to the main event. Uh, Belfort was offered an interim title fight against Lyoto Machido and then Gegar Mousasi as a replacement for Weidman, but he declined and stated that he would only fight for the full title. I, I think Vitor did the right thing. I don't want to see Vitor Machida. I certainly don't want to see Vitor Mousasi. Those guys, yeah. you know, they're, they're just not in the position that he's in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's also Vito has that position to say that that as well. I mean, with all the the drug scandals and things going on lately, wasn't he accused of doing some sort of? Well, he was. He was. Or, uh, he was one of the elite fighters on testosterone replacement therapy on TRT. Yeah. yeah. So he's. I, I agree. He's had to get off of that and um, adapt his body to not having that uh, that substance in it in order for him to be licensed to compete. Yeah. He's actually uh, undergone a, an extensive series of out of competition testing that so far he's passed with flying colors. That's good. I mean, if I, I think he, I think he's in the clear on that level. It's just going to be interesting to see if his performance is uh, is altered uh, because of not having TRT in his system. I mean, I think he should be fine. So hopefully we can see him back in there soon. Um, I was hoping that he would have taken either one of those fights against uh, Machida. He, he should have taken that fight, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's another fight. Everyone, everyone's it, he, yeah. for the same reason. Uh, interim title as well. That would have potentially set him up straight away for a, as, as soon as... Um, He's ready for for Weidman straight away for the for that match. Because did 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 Machida have a fight since losing to Weidman? I don't think so. I don't think he has. No. So I'm like, okay, I don't know. To me, the way I the way I perceive that is that Machida, you know, Machida lost to Weidman. He hasn't had a fight since. Uh, to immediately get another title fight off of a loss against Vitor, I don't think that Machida had earned it. And certainly, Gegard Mousasi has been really up and down. He looked great against Dan Henderson. But even that stoppage was somewhat controversial with the eye cut, and you know, the, the, you know, people thought the fight was stopped a little too soon. So I don't think either of those. I, I think they could have put up 